Welcome, welcome everybody to a very unusual DEF CON. Lots of things are different. Lots of things are staying the same, including, as always, the open organization of lock pickers, Lock Pick Village. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we hope that you can learn some things, have some fun, walk out more fired up about hacking and lock picking than you arrived. My particular part of this today is law school for lock pickers. What even is that? Well, by way of background, I'm Preston Thomas, a former board member of Tool. I'm a licensed attorney barred in the District of Columbia and in California, which is importantly different than barred from DC and California. I've done this talk before, including at DEF CON, but 2020 has brought this topic into a new light. Security research of all kinds from hacking, reverse engineering, social engineering, lock picking, these all rely on civil liberties of an open society with rule of law. Hacking is by nature subversive. Lock picking is no different. So like journalists and priests and security researchers, our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We can do things many people don't understand. For certain types of people, encountering something they don't understand makes them nervous, irrational, maybe even angry. I should know. I've worked with Tool for almost 10 years and been a lawyer for longer. And when people get nervous, irrational, or angry about lockpicking topics, it often ends up on my plate. Falls to me to explain it. I've had this particular conversation hundreds of times. So this talk today, it isn't for you. It's for me. I want to recruit all of you into my crusade to push back on the tide of bullshit about laws and lockpicking and how the two interact. I'm tired. I want to be done talking about this, but people won't let me. Help me, please. Let's do this. To begin with, I am a lawyer. I am not, however, your lawyer. This is so, so not legal advice. The only advice I'm going to give you today is don't get your legal advice from a guy at a con. Also, my opinions are my own. They don't represent Tool or anyone I work for. Standard disclaimer. Law and Order was a great show because half was the cops and half was the lawyers. For the law part, you can just Google what the laws are in a specific jurisdiction or, or how to talk to a law enforcement officer. There's great stuff on YouTube about that. This is not that talk. This talk is more the second part, the order part, about why lockpicking laws are the way they are and what it means for you as a practitioner dealing with lots of non-practitioners. Everyone has legal theories about lots of parts of daily life, not just lockpicking. Most of them are workable, some of them are nonsensical, some of them are absolutely bananas. And where do loopy legal theories tend to come from? Armchair lawyers. Armchair lawyers everywhere with their good old University of Wikipedia law degree. And their specialty area is something I like to call folklore. These are these ideas about law that everyone seems to know, but no one really seems to know where they came from. This is, I want my one phone call, or if you ask someone if they're a cop, they have to tell you, or I don't have to pay income taxes because I live in the free state of Jefferson. Because of folk law and all the people opining about it and spouting off about it, Googling about lockpicking laws on the internet is worse than Googling about that weird rash. So let's get real. Today, let's do this law school style. We're gonna be concrete, specific, and clear in how we use words. Let's start off this law, for, law school for lockpickers by building a law. Let's build a, a criminal statute called the possession of burglary tools, because that's almost always what we're talking about when we're talking about the legality of lockpicks. Criminal laws are constructed of elements. These elements are what need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt before someone can be legally found guilty of a crime. In the case of a burglary tool statute, there's usually two elements. Possession is physically having a tool or device, including lockpicks, and intent means criminal mindset, i.e. you intend to do something that is against the law. You can call this formula possession plus intent. Now, intent is difficult to get at. It's, it's in your head. It's not something the court has access to. So typically in a court of law, it's shown through circumstances. In other words, part of the district attorney's job is to show circumstances that make it beyond a reasonable doubt that a person had crime in mind at the time they possessed lockpicks. No circumstances, no intent, no intent, no crime. In most states, it's as simple as that. 
mere possession of lockpicks without any circumstances indicating unlawful intent, not a crime. You look across, you can see that is the vast majority of states. We color them green just because it's nice, it's soothing, uh, it sends the right message across. Uh, but what about those shadowy places you say in your best Jonathan Taylor Thomas 1994 Simba voice? Remember how I said intent was really hard to get at? The court can't know it's in someone's mind. So who better to provide evidence about the state of someone's mind than the person themselves? That is the thinking behind that minority of states that just throw up their hands and say, you tell me. I'm looking at you, Virginia, Ohio, Mississippi, Nevada. Laws change over time, but they pretty much solidified down to these four as having the possession plus intent formulation. So these states, they write their burglary tools so that possession of lockpicks is prima facie evidence of intent to commit a crime. We'll talk about prima facie here in a second. Here's an example from the Code of Virginia. For those of you who like to follow along, uh, this criminal code 18.2-94, the possession of such burglarious tools, implements, or outfit by any persons other than a licensed dealer shall be prima facie evidence of an intent to commit burglary, robbery, or larceny. So let's talk about that prima facie word. It's not law school without some Latin. Let's dive into it. Prima facie, Latin literally means on first face or, or on first impression, you can think of it. In plain English, that means if I didn't know better, I'd say something. Uh, I'd say you're up to no good. Turning that back into legal language, um, that's referred to as a rebuttable presumption. It's a presumption because it starts off set to true, default value true. It's rebuttable because that default value can be changed, which means the ball is in your court. Or in more colloquial terms, prima facie means splaining. And I put this GIF up there and I'm increasingly surprised how few people know what it's from. If you don't recognize this GIF, uh, I congratulations on your uh, high school graduation, I guess. Okay, so people will often say, uh, but I have a presumption of innocence, but my constitution, uh, I've got rights. And, and you're right, you, you do have rights, at least for the time being. Um, but the presumption of innocence is not one of the rights that's guaranteed in the Constitution. You can read it. It's not that long. Um, you should read it. It's worth the read. Uh, and one of the things you'll notice, there's no presumption of innocence mentioned in the Constitution. It flows indirectly from the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments. Uh, Coffin versus United States is one of the first cases you study in law school. And that shows how, even though it's not actually in the text, it was discovered as a necessary implication of the rights guaranteed explicitly in the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments. More importantly, though, this formulation of burglary law just won't be challenged in court because it's too much of an edge case to ever make it to trial. Uh, there's two things DAs hate. They hate crime and they hate losing cases. And because this formulation, um, even if it is arguably unconstitutional or, or might be, it'll never get tested because if it's such an edge case that you might be able to, to make a constitutional argument, the DA will shrug his hands and throw it out. Uh, he doesn't want to go down that route. That's not the, what his job is. He's got much bigger fish to fry. So um, these kinds of problems um, where the law is a little unclear and common sense doesn't seem to quite match up with the way the law is written. That's why humans are in the loop. There's district attorneys with prosecutorial discretion. There's judges sitting over each trial. They're specifically there to handle exceptions where the law as written doesn't quite match up with the facts on the ground. So uh, even if you might be able to have a constitutional problem with this formulation, know that it will probably never come to trial because no one's gonna care enough about a fact pattern like that to actually push it. Now, there's kind of a sense of, uh, you know, boo, hiss about these, uh, these states that have possession implies intent formulation. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, they're, they're just wrong or they're nonsensible or they're anti-hacker, anti-lockpicker. -lock but if you look at actually uh, what they're thinking is, it begins to make a little bit more sense and you have more sympathy for them. So I decided let's look at some of them. Uh, first of all, I didn't know what the Nevada flag looked like. I had to look that up just for this presentation. Here's what Nevada decided. 
is um, they said in a case 1965 that is still good law, um, they said it is consistent with all the constitutional protections of accused men to throw on them the burden of proving facts, particularly within their knowledge and hidden from discovery by the government. This is an illustrative example of the kind of reasoning that motivates possession implies intent state. You don't have to agree with it, but you can see what their thinking is. If we're having trial and the goal of the trial is to find out what the truth is and whether someone is guilty and that person has the information they say is relevant to the case, they should be able to provide it. If they have it, then uh, the least they could do is show it to the court. It kind of makes sense. It's very simple. Um, maybe it makes some of our civil liberties impulses a little squeamish, uh, but it's not unreasonable, especially when you consider the one that we collectively like a little bit better, which is the possession plus intent formulation, the, the more liberal version. Um, so why shouldn't we imply intent? And here's an example from the District of Columbia that shows the kind of reasoning involved in arriving at the idea that possession plus intent should be the proper formulation. And what they say is, and this is, this is great um, uh, close parsing by the, the judge. Uh, he says, although the sledgehammer, axe, and hacksaw, which the appellant had, quite clearly can be used criminally, they, may, they also may, and for the most part are, used for legitimate purposes. Since the mere fact of possession of such implements has no relevance to guilt, it may not be made the occasion of casting on the defendant the obligation of exculpation. In other words, unless what you're carrying are literally drugs or something else that's similarly illegal just for existing, then the cops have to introduce additional facts to overcome the statistical likelihood that you int intend to use them for a legal purpose. Uh, most people carrying axes, sledgehammers, hacks, uh, hammers, et cetera, uh, are using for legal purposes. So why in this case would we if infer that they're using it for anything other than legal purpose? When you walk through it like that, it's kind of tortured logic. You have to suddenly appreciate the people who say, hey, you know what? It's probably what it looks like unless you tell us otherwise. I have a lot, after doing the research for this, I have a lot more sympathy for the jurisdictions that decide to throw up their hands and say, you tell us. Uh, I know some of you in the back are saying, uh, hey, aren't there different types of intent under the law? Yes, but that's not relevant here. Um, any intent will do for this particular formulation. Now, uh, this kind of close parsing and close analysis of the way laws are written and what's the meaning behind them leads to some really funny outcomes, including my favorite lock picking case. It turns out I have a favorite lock picking case. We are once again back in the District of Columbia. Uh, this is a DC appeals court, still relatively recently from 2014. In Ray JW means it was a minor involved. So some kid under 18 got nicked by the cops. Funny circumstances. Here's what happened. Uh, JW was arrested red-handed trying to steal a Vespa with a pair of bolt cutters. He was charged with possession of implements of a crime, which is the usual statute that applies to lock picking. Both elements are satisfied, no question. He's sitting there, middle of the night, um, by the Vespa, bolt cutters in hand, uh, definition of caught red-handed, absolutely possession, absolutely intent. However, there's an inartful drafting of the statute because the statute specified, doesn't usually specify, but in this case it does, it specified tools for picking locks. Uh, a meticulous appeals court judge observed that picking a lock is generally understood to require skill rather than brute force and to turn the lock without damage to the lock. He literally went and looked up the definition of picking up, picking a lock in the dictionary and came back with that and entered it in the record. As a result of reading the statute across from the definitions, it was, the judge concluded, not physically possible to pick a lock with bolt cutters, nor is it legally possible to convict JW under the statute as written, because try as you might, those big old bolt cutters will not fit into the lock and turn it in a non-damaging fashion. Conclusion, no, no possession of tools designed for picking locks and JW goes free and anyone who complains about that gets to go back and write the statute a little bit more carefully. Uh, I think that is a great example of a judge 
carefully parsing the statute, holding the state to what they said they wanted, and then telling them if you want something different, you have to be a little bit more careful. Another thing I like about this is this means that we have it on record that all those savages and reprobates at conferences who destroy the locks and tie the lock picks into pretzels are not, legally speaking, picking locks. So here's the part that I think a lot of people show up for. The A number one absolute main area of shouting and nonsense regarding locks and lock picking is speculation on breaking the link between possession and intent. So let's talk about it. This is, this is in those states where possession implies intent, those minority of states. Um, well, what can we do to protect ourselves? Um, the, there's a thought that these are the places where lock picks are illegal and we have to be on our guard and we have to have, have an answer ready. Um, so, so what do we do about it? And something that often comes up is have a card, have some kind of self-made card or a more professional card, poof, problem solved. This is, this is that fantasy of holding it up to the officer and say, don't worry, officer, I have a permit for this. Um, that, it, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, there is no such thing as a get out of jail free card because they're absolutely allowed to have that conversation with you and by the time you're having that conversation, it is not in your interest to try to avoid that conversation. Uh, instead, I want you to think of if you're having a conversation about lockpicks with a cop, uh, you now it is in your interest to engage in and expand in and own that conversation rather than trying to flash some kind of card and, and avoid it. The tool membership card, which is forthcoming, contains a few carefully crafted paragraphs to help you achieve a productive tone in that conversation, um, essentially as it act as a conversation starter. Uh, it's a way to help you have the conversation effectively rather than avoid the conversation. Uh, it explains that Tool is an organization that exists, that recreational lockport, locksport is a thing that exists, that the holder of the card is a member of Tool, and it gives a gloss on the general state of overall laws. Uh, it doesn't overplay its hand. It basically digs down to the idea, idea that what we teach and what we do at Tool is legal everywhere in the United States by definition because lock sporters and researchers have a legitimate use for their picks and they follow the two rules. The two rules which are quite famously in Tool, don't pick a lock that you don't own, don't pick a lock upon which you rely. If you're following those rules, then you don't fall afoul of either formulation of the state law, no matter where you are. So that set helps set the right tone. If you're a conscientious locksport practitioner, you know, don't hide them, don't lie about why you have them. Essentially, don't act guilty if you aren't guilty. People will sometimes come, come to me and say, Preston, that's all well and good, but what if I'm doing this or that or the other thing? What about this circumstance? And what I always tell them is, if what you're doing is a crime, then you are literally doing what the crime of possession of burglary tool says, and you have no basis to complain. If, on the other hand, you are not, and you're practicing good lock sport ethics, and you're following tools rules, then you can be safe in knowing that what you are doing is legal in every state in the union, and you have a card to help explain that concept to anyone who's asking. Now, uh, we are very serious about keeping our members and our friends on the right side of the law. Nonetheless, and, and I wanna emphasize, this is not legal advice. This is just wisdom that any person in the society should know. Let me give you a rule of thumb. Call it the one crime at a time rule. If you choose to break the law, don't break the law while you're breaking the law. Don't accidentally turn a legitimate hobby into an indictable offense by carrying lockpicks along on a time when you shouldn't have them. Uh, in the words of legal philosopher William Smith, in the matter of Earth versus Giant Bug, 1997, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. Uh, I have heard from many police officers, many ju different jurisdictions. Uh, I've asked them, I have been on public transit, sitting there picking on my practice locks, and they, I've, I've said, hey guys, I'm sitting here picking locks. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's acceptable. Do you have any problem with it? And they say, plan on picking locks on the train? Are you planning on picking locks on the airplane? They don't care. Uh, they have actual crimes to worry about. If you're sitting there as a law-abiding citizen doing something that's not bothering anybody, 
it's not worth their time. Um, so don't be nervous about it and, uh, and don't, you, don't um, worry about ignorance of the law becoming a problem for you because you're willing to have that conversation. Another area that people oftentimes ask about is federal law, particularly TSA. DEF CON is, the, uh, is one of the most common sources of that question because people say, well, I just bought lockpicks, but now I can't take them on an airplane. Um, it's, it's, um, well, it's not, it's not a factor because it is literally, uh, I've missed, I've lost a T somewhere. I've got to fix that. But um, it is literally not a factor because TSA has a set of things that they're looking for and a set of things that, that are not on their list. Uh, because a lock picking tool is a non-sharp tool, less than seven inches, it's carry on approved. It's simply not disallowed, which means it's allowed. And, and don't say this to TSA if you're having that conversation, but the locks on the cockpit doors are not even pin tumbler locks. Um, so all the more reason for it not to be on their list. After years and years of asking them, um, we've got a Twitter conversations from a bunch of different people here. Um, they finally, their agents finally added uh, lock picks explicitly to their, uh, can I bring my self-service site on the website? Uh, so if this is a concern for you and you would like a little extra backup, then feel free, go on the website, take a screenshot, print it out, throw it in your lock pick kit. Uh, I've done it, I know uh, a lot of friends of mine and Tool have done it. We carried around our lock pick kit for years and years and years until it got ratty and torn up. Then we threw it away and we never used it. Uh, once again, because TSA agents just don't care. But remember, uh, like anything that you wanna carry on a plane, the TSA agent gets the last call. So be polite, be friendly, be patient with them. Um, whether you're doing an opt-out or bringing something unusual through carry-on, just make sure you have enough time to have the discussion without being rushed or being flustered. Yes, I like opting out. There's good ethical reasons to it, even though sometimes it's a pain in the butt. I, if I'm in a hurry, I don't wanna miss my flight. Yeah, I'll go through the scanner. Um, carrying lock picks is likewise. If I'm really in a hurry, I'll just check them. But for the most part, I like carrying them on A, because I know where they are, because they're valuable. Make sure, make sure they don't get broken but also to make sure that I'm practicing what I preach and telling people, yes, it's not a problem. And on the rare occasion to have those conversations, then I can make it that much easier for the next person coming behind me that's bringing lock picks. One of the best pieces of advice I get when I got in law school, when you're having conversations like this, is always try to seem like the most reasonable person in the room, in, seem like the most reasonable person in the room. If you seem like you're prepared for the conversation, if it's not a surprise for you, uh, then that really helps them be that much more calm about it. Uh, as a last resort, many airports will give you the option to mail something home rather than trashing it. Another great option if you've got time to take advantage of it. Here's what I do when I'm taking my lock picks through an airport. Um, this is my bin on the inside of security uh, at San Francisco. Note the gigantic bag of lock picks, including, including the fuzzy handcuffs right on top, just in case anyone wants to get curious. That's all totally legal. As are the Bogotas in my wallet, which uh, is there on the right. No one ever notices that. Ironically, the illegal thing in the, in the picture is that little bottle of crack and rum there. I totally did not know that you were not allowed to bring the little bottles through security or under the airplane. You're not allowed to provide your own booze. So yes, there is something illegal going on in that picture. No, it's not the lockpicks. Yes, it is the booze. Uh, a note on having fun with TSA. Um, I like putting the handcuffs on top because um, if they're gonna open up the bag, I like to put a smile on their face. It gives them the problem of, do they dig around the handcuffs? Are they allowed to pick the handcuffs up? This is you know a dildo versus your dildo territory. Um, so um, as long as they're gonna have the conversation, there's no reason we can't make it a little bit fun. Uh, and before you ask, Yes, handcuffs are also legal, uh, or, um, are also permitted in carry-on. Uh, lots of good reasons for that, including uh, security officers and police officers that always travel with handcuffs. Um, a few years ago, Lady Gaga brought her own fuzzy handcuffs, and there's a bit of a hullabaloo about it, but uh, they were, of course, allowed on. So um, fun lockpick tricks, uh, just carry, hand carry fuzzy handcuffs as well. Uh, it helps set the conversation on the right mode. Um, a comment that I got from uh, Max, who works for, with Tool, 
Uh, he said, always remember that uh, you can help the conversation along by giving some framing. So if you see the your bag of lockpicks go through the x-ray and the person's eyes kind of light up and they shunt it off to the side for further inspection, wave at the guy um, as, he, as you're walking over. So that's the conversation just right. I see you've got my bag of lock picking equipment there. Um, I do this, that, or the other thing. I do lock sport as a hobby. Inside, you will find the following things. Uh, you can help them get in the right frame. And there's kind of an art to uh, helping them arrive at their own conclusions rather than dictating to them, and uh, which in a way that might make them suspicious. So uh, don't avoid the conversation. Welcome the chance to practice the conversation. It's almost always no big deal because again, it's a non-sharp tool less than seven inches. And we will pass handcuffs and we will go to the rest of the world. And people often ask me now uh, that I've talked about the United States, what about the rest of the world? And the answer is the rest of the world does not differ materially from the United States for the most part. Uh, everywhere around the world, you'll find com countries and individual jurisdictions with both formulations. The most common formulation is possession plus intent, but there are some places that have possession implies intent. Uh, so Commonwealth, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they're all legal. Some of them are possession plus intent. Some of them are possession implies intent, uh, but none of them make it strictly illegal. Netherlands, as we know, tool having started in the Netherlands, perfectly legal and there's quite a robust culture there. Israel, a little bit more tightened down. They're definitely in the possession implies intent camp. And I'm given to understand that in China, they are fairly illegal, but like many things in China, it depends on who your patron is. So yes, when Tool goes to China, we do take lockpicks with us. We teach lockpicking there and we get it all cleared through the proper authorities and we haven't had a problem yet. Now, there's one last thing that needs to be said before I round this out, which is 2020 is in some ways different than other years, in some ways no different than it ever was. We're just learning more about it now. The Black Lives Matter movement has really drawn a lot more attention to the interaction between uh, young black people, people of color and law enforcement. And it wouldn't be right to finish this talk without mentioning that all the advice I gave works great if you are a uh, white, reasonably well-educated male lawyer. Does it work as well if you're not some of those things? And the only answer I can tell you is all the principles remain the same but it is absolutely hard mode. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, you might have to uh, speak, speak better, understand better, make yourself heard better to get the same results. And there's nothing that I can say to make that okay in this talk or to really give a lot of insight from a perspective other than mine. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, the, the law is the same and many of the same principles apply, uh, but it's hard mode. So, that is the laws of lock picking. I understand as we end this, I'll have a chance to take questions. So for anyone who has questions about lock picking in the US, around the world, who has stories they wanna tell, who has hypotheticals that they wanna get insight on, I would be happy to share them. Mostly, thank you for showing up for this conversation. Happy lock picking, look forward to seeing you around.